Hi, and welcome to our first episode of In Focus, a series brought to you by the World Economic Forum's network of the Global Future Councils. I'm your host, Lea Weibel, joining you from the Forum studio in Geneva, Switzerland. In this series, our goal is to highlight cutting edge and complex ideas, transformative solution addressing the world's most pressing challenges, and to share profound insights from members of the network of the Global Future Councils. What if you could have access to the brightest minds in the world? They could address the most pressing issues from AI and space to climate change and energy transition. But that's not all. The whole network amplifies conversations around urgent topics, bringing together diverse perspectives from academia, business, civil society, public figures and other stakeholders. This is what the network of the Global Future Councils is all about. In this first episode, we are going to talk about the air we breathe, the vital essence of life. Yet, its quality is under constant threat from pollution. Air pollution may be invisible, but its impacts are profound and far-reaching. It's a silent killer. The World Health Organization estimates that 9 out of 10 people breathe air containing high levels of pollutants, resulting in 7 million deaths per year. Research shows that out of the 36 highest emitting countries, 20 are among the least affected by climate change. Meanwhile, 11 of the 17 countries with the lowest greenhouse gas emissions are among the most vulnerable to climate change. From jeopardizing our health to amplifying climate change, addressing air quality is crucial for our well-being and the sustainability of our planet. I am delighted to welcome three inspiring members of our Global Future Council on Clean Air, who will discuss why clean air matters and how we can collectively work towards cleaner air. Allow me to introduce Toluoni, clinical professor in global health at the University of Cambridge and founder of the initiative Urban Better, through which she is pioneering collaborative efforts with city leaders and communities to transform urban spaces into healthier environments. Iyad Kerbeck brings unparalleled expertise on this topic as director of air quality at C40 Cities, an organization which is collaborating with cities on air quality, climate and public health initiatives. The discussion will be moderated by Aruna Bagosh, a trailblazing leader in public policy and sustainability in Delhi, India, where he is the founder and CEO of the Council on Energy, Environment and Water a top-tier policy research institution in Asia and among the world's leading 20 climate think tanks. Arunaba, the floor is yours. Thank you, Leah. I'm Arunaba Ghosh, your host for today's deep dive on clean air. And I'm going to dive straight in with two of our council members, Toluoni and Yad Kerbeck. Tolu, may I start with you first? Uh, tell us why is air pollution such a big problem the WHO says 99% of the world's population breathes air that doesn't meet its standards. Why is it so? Yes, I remember. It's, um, it's a very obvious thing, but on many levels it's complex, right? So I think the first thing is that it's invisible, right? So this is something that the threat is not that apparent. And related to that is whether people are measuring it or not. So we can't change what we don't measure. Right? So the first thing is the measurement. I think the second really critical um, um, reason is that a significant reason why it's so critical is that it impacts health. But there's very little or insufficient knowledge to understand really just how much it impacts the health. So people know that we, we, know, we know we're seeing things like a rise in uh, children with asthma, a rise in cardiovascular heart mm. disease, rising lung cancers. But still, not enough people understand really the impact of air pollution in contributing to a rise in those, in those, um, in those diseases that we're seeing. So they, are, so they see the effects, they don't understand the cause. Mm. But Ia, are all cities across the world affected evenly? Yeah, so I don't know about your, the, the statistic you noted was is stunning. 99% mm. of people exposed to poor air quality. Mm. And the World Health Organization estimates one person in every 13 minutes is dying from air pollution. Mm. 
And Tolu described some of the myriad of the additional health effects from air pollution, mm -hmm. from new cases of asthma that affect health over an entire lifetime, to lung cancer, to neurological effects. So this is a major stress mm -hmm. on health systems in cities. We spoke a lot during this week about the impact in cities. And in cities particularly, you have high densities of people living mm. close to sources of pollution and often vulnerable people, people mm. with pre-existing health conditions. So when you talk about are all people impacted equally, they're not impacted equally across cities. So many cities in the global south, for example, have mm. much higher air pollution levels than in the global north. Mm. And even within cities, we see wide disparities. And this is also true even in the global north. For example, in New York City, air pollution levels or asthma associated with air pollution levels within the city vary 30-fold mm. when you account for changes in exposure and changes in underlying health outcomes. And, and another thing is it's often perceived as a delayed thing. So, you know, you know, it may, you may understand it's a problem, but, you know, the impacts are happening, mm. you know, um, down the road. But actually the evidence that we see is that reducing and tackling air pollution can have quite near-term benefits on, on, on health. But Tolu, you work in some of these cities in the mm. global south. Mm. So what are cities doing mm. about mm. confronting this mm. problem, which is major in general, but also matters from an equity point of view. Yeah, yeah. So I would say, um, I would say four things, right? The first mm. thing is around measurement, right? And okay. a lot of, in a lot of cities I work in, I work predominantly in cities in countries across the African continent, mm. and the measurement has been entirely insufficient. Um, and that's relevant because it's the, it's one of the fastest growing um, regions. It's got the youngest population. So mm -hmm. the, it's the youngest continent. Uh, so the opportunities to actually improve health are great. And yet we're seeing this almost um, this premature um, uh, mortality. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing, you know, ill health actually um, preventing um, cities from maximizing this asset. So one is measurement. We're seeing a rise in, in, in measurement. So we're seeing, and I can go into some examples. So we're seeing, for example, um, a city like Lagos, which is like the largest mm. um, city on the continent. Um, we're seeing just in the last 18 months um, uh, deployment of uh, low-cost census net network across the city uh -huh. to really start to measure. Related to that, the second point of measurement is when you're not measuring, measuring is an, is an issue. When you're measuring, it's equally critical that data is in the hands of people, right? right? So measurement is of no good if it's just, you know, comes out in a report in two years' time about right. the air quality sure. two years ago. Right. Um, so what we're seeing is this participatory um, uh, air quality measurement and um, t um, platforms coming up where people can access the air you're breathing on an app where you can actually access that information, mm -hmm. which of course drives the demand. So people are seeing that, hang on, I didn't realize my air was that bad. Or I didn't realize, I thought the whole city was right. bad, but now I see my area is worse than your area. Why is that? Mm -hmm. So second is measurement. The third is inclusion, right? So on participation. So one of the things, again, um, I just come from Lagos, so that's kind of the example that's for my mind, is recognizing that even how we deploy the census, right? It's not, yes, this is a government responsibility and partnership with different mm. um, sectors, mm. but there's an opportunity to leverage civil society, leverage the majority demographic, which in Africa is youth, mm. to say, where are the areas that we should be measuring, right? Where right. are the priority areas? Right. So we're seeing participation right. in our measurement. And then the last is co-creation. Right, mm -hmm. so thinking about knowledge and partnerships with researchers um, and understanding, right, okay, this is not something, research shouldn't be something that researchers do in a university and then you come to policy making and you right. say, let's do that. But we actually co-designing, like what, what are the questions that um, research can support with mm -hmm. and how can we actually generate the evidence that is relevant and that is implementable? In fact, even the city I come from in Delhi, my organization and the government we've been working in, getting that hyper-local data mm -hmm. across hundreds of different sources mm -hmm. to help drive that mm -hmm. co-created action. Mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, Tolu referred to Lagos in Africa. Yeah. Are there examples that you can give us from maybe cities in Asia that yeah. are taking this head on? 
Absolutely. And I want to pick up on a point Tolu made earlier, which I think is absolutely right. Mm. Air pollution is one of those issues where you can see benefits very quickly mm. compared to mm. other environmental problems, mm. which, for example, climate change, where actions today, you're trying to avoid issues mm. around the line, even though right. obviously climate change is happening already. Right. So, for example, in um, Beijing, air pollution levels went down by nearly 50 percent in a period of almost 10 to 15 years. Mm. Similarly, in New York City, 50 percent mm. decline. And the health outcomes. There are studies from Southern California that the um, interventions that were taken to clean up the vehicle fleets in Southern California mm. have had a significant and measurable benefit in terms of asthma in, uh, in children. So when you look at some of the other cities, for example, in the global north and, and in, um, in Asia, you're seeing really a multi-layer type of intervention that's working in those places. So national governments that are taking the issue seriously, right. setting standards right. and putting in the right types of policy and regulation and local actors, lo uh, cities and local governments then implementing those actions and then bottom up grassroots organizations supporting those types of actions. One example in Beijing, over mm. the last 10 years, they've converted over a million, cook, a million heating systems from mm. coal to cleaner fuels, which has contributed to that large PM2.5 air pollution reduction I spoke about earlier. Other places, like London, they've really um, taken transport sources and right. made that a priority for the city. Right. So really going back 10 years, starting by addressing congestion in the city, mm. implementing a low emission zone to address freight-related emissions, all the way till last year, they have what's called an ultra-low emission zone, mm. the largest in the world of mm -hmm. a vehicle restriction that only lets the cleanest vehicles into the city without charging them, and then creating the zero emission investments to support uh, public transport, sub uh, support walking, and zero emission vehicles. I think what both of you are highlighting is that this is an eminently solvable problem, mm. right? The, if you measure and you empower and work together between communities and governments, you can get it done. Even then, often there seems to be the sense of helplessness. So mm. can you give some examples of how individuals can feel empowered to uh, be part of the solution and not just feel helpless as a victim? Right. Yeah, first you. Well, first thing, vote, participate. <laughs> we need citizens to be supportive of these types of actions. Mm. The second piece is expanding the education around the awareness, and that is really on, um, on governments and on folks like us who work in this sector. Mm. What we found in a lot of polling, while some people might know that air pollution is bad for you, they may not understand what are the sources of air pollution that's, that are causing harm and what are the solutions that they need to be supporting. So I think that level of expanding education, expanding civic participation to support mm -hmm. these types of measures. Mm. And then there's some other pieces around changing your own behavior. Often addressing air pollution requires all of us to work together right. to address air pollution and recognize that we're all part of the solution. It's all our common air. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you mentioned the other common air. It's a, another global commission of which I'm a part, which brought out a call to action that mm. a, clean air is an economic asset. Mm. But Tolu, again, back to the individual. Mm. Um, there is the sense of helplessness. There are ways in which they could be empowered. And yet some would argue, at least provocatively, that look, they have many other developmental priorities, mm. especially in the global south. Mm. So why should that individual mm. care about air as opposed to feeding their family? Mm. So how does that person yeah. feel empowered to take this home? Yeah, yeah. So I want to pick up on um, Ia's point around civic participation um, as a side. But what you said about helplessness is an interesting one. To, to some extent, it's true. Mm. Um, but if you look at the climate space more, more broadly, right. right, not air pollution in, 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 in particular, what we're seeing, and, and particularly um, amongst the, the young, um, young adult population, youth population, you're seeing this increasing agency, this sense of purpose, this sense of justice, and the sense that actually this is something that affects me now, this affects, this affects my, my future. Mm. And you don't see as much of a helplessness there, which is, which is almost a paradox, right? Because climate is, we say it's framed as something that is more abstract and less right. relevant, but actually you're seeing this agency and this sense of um, this movement, right? Of saying, you know, this is our future, here's what we, we, we demand. So the question has been, well, how can you leverage that energy, that enthusiasm, that kind of can-do into something like air pollution? Right. 
And it should be easier, right? Because you can connect it better to your day to day. And bringing on civic participation, I would I would add a citizen science, right? So this is an opportunity. So civic participation is voting. It is getting engaged in in in, in local politics. But civic participation is also not vote once every four years for sure, right. five years, right? And this is this is the potential of something like citizen science, right? To say how can you leverage this enthusiasm, this interest to understand what's going on to be part of the solution, and how can you actually support with the data generation, right? So for example, we see measurement of, in, improved measurement of air quality through the static sensors. Mm. But in a lot of cities where um, the environments are changing very rapidly, we see actually the, the exposures are very dynamic, people's mm. personal exposures are very dynamic. So mm. how can we actually think much more uh, nimbly about how we measure. And citizen science is one way. So right. there's there's in better technology around the use of wearable sensors. There's better um, understanding of the need for bringing in lived environments. So numbers are one thing, but the, the heart, the, the head doesn't think until the heart feels, right? And so that understanding of these are the kinds of exposures, these are the kinds of sources of air pollution that you can actually connect to the number. So when you say your PM 2.5 is... 100. What does that actually mean? Well, these are the kinds of, this is what we're seeing on the ground. This sure. is what, um, this is where the sources are. And that can be really powerful. And then connecting it to people's experiences. So we have examples, for example, in, um, of community participation in, in Kampala, in, in, in Uganda, where they engaged, um, market women to kind of understand, you know, there's a lot of, um, use of open, um, open flames and, and, and burning and that mm. sort of thing. And you could argue, well, it's my livelihood. This is what I need to be doing now. But when you share the, um, the, um, the evidence that we have is like, you know, actually, has your child hasn't had a, a health issue? Mm. The child that you've actually got you in your back or is playing around the area, right. what is it costing you in terms right. of health care? Can you actually, you can't afford to not work, but can you afford to have this um, continued exposure? But, but that links with justice, right? You can't say to people, oh, don't do this. It's like, well, what should I do? Right? What's the is alternative? My, what is the alternative? Yeah. But often, often it's not just the air quality framing, right? The example you gave from Kampala, even in India, there's been massive push on cleaner cooking fuel. Mm. But then it's not just the air quality story. It becomes about gender. Mm -hmm. It becomes about equity. Mm -hmm. It becomes about development. Yep. So, uh, yeah, at the end of the day, even if we empowered the individual, this is, we are all members of the Global Future mm -hmm. Council. So what are the priorities then we've identified yeah. to take this agenda forward? So you're absolutely right. And I, and I think um, your last point is very important, and that's how we need to be thinking about air quality as an issue, as this issue that meets multiple challenges mm -hmm. from equity, from economic development, from public health, from climate. Mm -hmm. And that's how we bring together a much larger group of stakeholders to work on this issue. Mm -hmm. In terms of some of the priorities that we discussed this week that I think are absolutely spot on, we discussed data and expansion of awareness, right. trying to improve our communications on this issue, mm. taking what is sometimes a very complex issue that can be sometimes difficult to grasp and making it simpler and easier to understand for mm. the public, for our decision makers, for our politicians. We talked about um, increasing capacity to act within countries, which is always very important, mm. and improving those institutions to address uh, air pollution. And then, of course, access to finance. That's yes. the very important issue that mm. we're going to face everywhere. Mm. These solutions are often out there, and it's a question of linking the solutions to finance to then implement them on the ground. And that's where things start to get really challenging. Mm. How do we implement the solutions that we know work? Uh, are there any other priorities yeah. that he yeah, has not mentioned? <laughs> well, I think the other the other is specifically the issue of black carbon, mm -hmm. right? So this mm. is a this is a, a an emergent issue where we know this in terms of um, um, uh, specific specific pollutants that we know significantly accelerate um, the the climate crisis and also push us towards tipping point, but also really critically have um, huge impacts on health. And yet there is not. Um, sufficient understanding or action around that. So we identified the need to really take this out of the super scientific space and the geeky space, which, you know, if you're a geek, you kind of love, but, you know, what are you going to do about it, right, into the communication space and the help, helping with the implementers and the fi people financing to say, why is this an issue? There's something is, why is this neglected and what can we do about it? 
And there's also this kind of cities index that mm. we're developing, right. yeah. you know, which yeah. is again not looking at just the pollution, but the policies. The policies, yeah. Right? And, the and the equity dimension. Mm -hmm. You know, so mm -hmm. it's again not just a finger pointing. Yeah. Yeah. So how does how do cities empower themselves by yeah. saying, I know I have a problem, mm -hmm. but this is how I plan mm -hmm. to solve mm -hmm. it. I yeah. need your help. Yeah. And related to that, understanding the importance of shared learning, mm. right? So given the urgency of this, you know, a lot of cities, you know, actually get to the point of, you know, we're measuring, we see this as urgent, we actually get the intersectoral governance and collaboration in place, and now we want to do, we want to look for projects based on what our priorities are. Yeah. And I'm finding that a lot of the cities are still starting from scratch and kind of trying to devise it. At the same time, there's a lot of information out there. So one of the things that the Global Future Council is doing is looking at clusters of, of, of cities as part of the cities index to say, okay, it may be the city next door to you, um, in a country next door to you, or it may be a city in a different continent, on a different continent mm -hmm. that says actually it's, it's similar in terms of developmental stage, in terms of population density. These are some of the policies and some of the initiatives that they've tried in these different sectors mm -hmm. so that you actually can get a sense of what has worked and what hasn't worked, right. and also linking that to the finance stream of saying, okay, how can we make sure that when cities find these projects, that the financing is there, and particularly, because you mentioned development a couple of times, yes. particularly the development finance that is actually there to do this, this work. And as, as we close off, I think one of the things is, yeah, if you could reflect on how does that finance flow to the city level right. administrators and not get stuck somewhere in right. either. That's right. So it's the it's about creating viable, bankable projects that are ready to ready to be deployed, and then working to then identify what are the right financial tools and mechanisms to get that money flowing and get those projects off the ground. There is a wealth of projects that are ready to go in many cities to improve mm -hmm. air quality. We heard a great example this week about uh, brick kilns in Pakistan mm -hmm. um, that could produce huge air quality and public health benefits, but is currently held up because of a lack of finance. Mm -hmm. and so I think it is a, a, a big effort and a mm. big need of this community to figure out how do we flow that finance to cities. Mm -hmm. We're out of time, but I just wanted to highlight once again that during this conversation, someone somewhere in the world has died because of air pollution. Uh, and we can't forget that it is our lived reality that is the challenge we confront as individuals. But as both Tolu and Iyad have highlighted, there is also a global solidarity behind this. Now, it's a solvable problem. It's the individuals connected to the cities, cities connected to their national governments, and national governments connected through a global network mm. uh, of financial institutions, networks like C40, academic institutions, civil society organizations uh, that can take on a challenge that we all face and solve it. That is the future of clean air. Thank you. Arunaba, Tolu, and Diyad, this was such a powerful message. Thank you so much. It's clear that achieving cleaner air requires collective action from individuals to governments, communities to global networks. This was the first episode of In Focus. If you want to learn more about the Global Future Councils, please check out our webpage. Until next time.